Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. Today we have a very special episode because I am joined by three temporary guest co-hosts. They are Greg Knuckles, Dr. Eric Helms, and Dr. Mike Zordos. And this is not a random assembly of guests. Collectively, the four of us are the authors of the Mass Research Review, which stands for Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. The first day of every month, we put out 10 pieces of content. This includes articles, videos, and audio roundtable discussions. And we basically provide concise and applicable breakdowns of the latest strength physique and nutrition research. So we break down the research, but arguably more importantly, we discuss how to apply it for yourself or for your clients. If you've been thinking about subscribing to Mass, we figured we should probably let you know that we are currently running our big annual charity sale, which is our biggest sale of the year. So these are the lowest prices that you're ever gonna see for Mass subscriptions. Uh, Our monthly subscriptions are typically 29 per month. During this sale, they're all the way down at 21 per month. And we also have huge discounts on our annual subscriptions and our lifetime subscriptions. If you subscribe to Mass during the sale, 100% of your first monthly subscription payment or $21 per subscriber for new annual and lifetime subscriptions will go to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. This is a really important organization dedicated to saving lives and bringing hope to those affected by suicide, and we are really excited to be raising funds for them this year. Finally, I will note that today we are gonna discuss a bunch of mass articles about recent research in today's episode. If you want to read Greg's review about myonuclear accretion or my review about vitamin D supplementation and strength, those articles are now freely available over at strongerbyscience.com. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's meet the mass authors and dive into some research. So, first of all, Dr. Mike Zordos, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. How are you doing, Trex? I'm doing well. Uh, now, for some of our listeners who aren't familiar with you and your background, do you mind giving us a, a quick biographical statement, what, who you are and what you're all about? Of course. Um, I'm five foot five inches tall. I'm still growing, which is nice to, nice to know. Nice. I am an associate professor at Florida Atlantic University, which is in Boca Raton, Florida, and was fortunate enough to hook up with you guys in 2017 to be able to create mass. So my research focuses on resistance training uh, in healthy people and in disease populations for strength and muscle growth adaptations. Awesome. And people who aren't mass subscribers still have probably seen your name because your lab puts out a lot of really solid uh, research in our area. Now, we're also joined by the good Dr. Eric Helms. And there's a nasty rumor out there that he and I are the same person. So one of the reasons we've had you on the show before, but that didn't really seem to dispel those rumors at all. But we think maybe a second round might do it. Uh, so Dr. Helms, for those who don't know you, uh, how about a quick bio? Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to be back on uh, and still not being you. I'm sure it is great to be you, Eric, um, but you, you'd be I surprised. prefer being me. No, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. Well, then I am a, I'm, I'm a lucky Eric. Um, so yeah, like, like you said, my name's Eric. And uh, most relevant stuff, I am the 2019 second place middleweight finisher at the uh, INBF Muscle Mayhem. Um, I'm six foot and I'm not growing. I'm not getting taller uh, like Zerdos, but I absolutely am growing in uh, bicep size. I've been up about quarter millimeter in the last couple of years. So I expect that to continue in that that trajectory. Um, But I am down here in New Zealand um, at the Auckland University of Technology. I am a researcher at Sports Performance Research Institute New Zealand, uh, where I do research specifically looking at strength and physique sport with my lovely doctoral and master's students. Uh, And I'm also chief science officer and uh, one of the co-founders of 3D Muscle Journey, where we coach drug-free strength and physique athletes of all levels, competitive and non-competitive. I write stuff. And generally, I'm just far too obsessed with bodybuilding and, uh, and strength sport. But... That's why I'm here, I guess, right? Yeah, and you kind of sold yourself short there. So you mentioned your uh, bodybuilding credential, but lately you've been competing in everything that could even loosely be associated with strength sports. So uh, you've been doing the bodybuilding and uh, weightlifting and strongman and powerlifting, and I think you have a big thumb wrestling tournament coming up in a couple weeks. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, You know, one, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war is uh, something that I... Yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> we're, 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 we're pacifists, but it's a very competitive environment here. Um, we don't mess around. Um, you know, the saying is she'll be right uh, until you get in the thumb war ring. And that's when things go wrong for everybody. And we walk around with a lot fewer thumbs afterwards. So Awesome. Well, we'll have to bring you back on and get get a rundown how that of how that tournament went. But for today's episode, what we really wanted to do... Actually, can I butt in? Sure. So there's obviously an elephant in the room. I'm just going to say what we're all thinking. Helms clearly got robbed at the IMBF Muscle Mayhem show. He should have won. Far too many of the judges mailed in the ballots. Uh, you know, I, I think there wasn't sufficient oversight. Helms' side, they didn't allow enough uh, observers in the room when they were counting those ballots. Uh, we need a very robust Stop the Steal campaign uh, to mm -hmm. reinstate Eric Helms as the rightful winner of INBF Muscle Mayhem. I also noticed a lot of those judges' cards were filled out with black ink and signed with blue ink. So I don't know how that works. How does that happen? You well, tell me. And, and all of the Pro Helms judges uh, used Sharpie, which uh, I think that may have gotten some of their ballots invalidated. Mm. How do you feel about that, Helms? Well, you know, I... I think that all legal votes should be counted. Let me just come out and say that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there there are some rumors going around uh, that, that the winner of the middleweight class, uh, Adam McDonald, that he was actually a 3DMJ athlete uh, coached by Jeff Alberts. And then after that, he went on to win the national title, title in Ireland, um, trying to paint him in some picture as, as, as part of 3DMJ. I mean, technically he is and still is. Uh, and, and technically, he did win that national title, showing his his uh, bona fides as, a, as an amateur bodybuilder. But but look at it this way. Like, if you have to have votes counted after prejudging to win, uh, which allegedly uh, I've heard. I don't have any evidence to, to prove that, but that's what I've heard. Um, I've got some YouTube videos I can send you. Then then really, does that validate or invalidate uh, that, that win or, or your bona fides? So, Wait, is, is he is he Irish? Yes, he is. W would you say there may have been some foreign inter interference in that show then? <laughs> that's, uh, yes, absolutely. That's, that's, that's a good point that I, that I hadn't considered. I need to, I'll have to set up a, a press conference to talk about that, maybe in front of some type of, you know, random shop in an industrial sector or something like that. All I'm saying is that by January 20th, it's going to be clear that you won that show. Uh, and the deep state of natural bodybuilding will be exposed. Yep. That's certainly one perspective. Yeah, that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with today's episode, uh, one of the reasons we're excited to have all the mass research reviewers on is because we wanted to have a nice recap of volume four of mass. So volume four, it comes out every single month. The first day of the month, volume four was all of the year two, uh, 2020. A lot of people are saying the best year on record just across the board. So it was also a great year for mass. Uh, we had a lot of really good issues and we wanted to kind of go through the highlights and, and have each author talk about some of their favorite work that they published in mass in the year 2020. So Dr. Helms, I want to start with you. We've already talked about some of the controversies in bodybuilding. You had a really good article that was actually bodybuilding research, which is unfortunately really hard to do and, and as a result, pretty rare in the literature. So you covered a study um, that looked at the first bodybuilding style refeed research. So why don't you give us a little rundown of what they found, but also just kind of what it means in, in the broader sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, this came out of uh, the good Dr. Bill Campbell's lab. And uh, Eric, I know you've done some some work with them. Um, and I know Dr. Campbell, he, he does great work. It's It's been really cool to see him and his lab produce a lot of very, uh, like you said, bodybuilding relevant research. Um, so they came out with the first, I would argue, probably like truly representative, ecologically valid uh, refeed style research. So most of what we have in the the realm of uh, nonlinear dieting, if you will, uh, or what is typically called intermittent energy restriction, has setups that aren't really used in, at least in, in our little circle of, of strength and physique sport as ways to drop weight. Um, this is almost like the reverse of one of the more common things. If you've ever heard of the five and two diet, that's actually where you have 
uh, five days at, at roughly maintenance and then two days that are very, very, very low calorie uh, intake, sometimes just of like a protein shake and sometimes 24 hour fasting. So that's the type of research that's out there. Uh, this is a, the opposite of that. Like I said, like a five and two diet where instead you've got two days uh, that are in uh, that are at maintenance and then five days that are at a, a moderate or moderately high deficit. Uh, and this is a very kind of standard approach that you've seen in the last few years in bodybuilding circles uh, where you'll have, you know, four or five days of dieting and then a handful of days as quote unquote refeeds. Um, I would say, you know, more popularly, and we talked about this in our review paper, Eric, about uh, natural bodybuilding is that you'll see like cheat meals traditionally uh, or cheat days. Uh, and I think those have transitioned to becoming, say, you know, refeeds. And I'd say since the early to mid 2000s, like uh, coaches like Dr. Joe Klimczewski and, and Lane Norton and, and us at 3DMJ, we've we've said, hey, you know, the goal isn't to have a day where you get to cheat on your diet, uh, but rather we need to think about some of the potential benefits uh, of bringing calories up. And a lot of that was based on, you know, mechanistic research, animal data, and kind of extrapolating from some of the few trials uh, on intermittent energy restriction uh, in individuals with obesity or in clinical populations, or even sometimes, you know, normal weight people who are not resistance training and trying to see, you know, how can we get a benefit from this? So uh, this is a really cool study because like you said, it was a pretty long study. It was a seven week period uh, and they had resistance trained individuals who were, uh, at a pretty, I'd say, quote unquote, like normal body fat percentage. Uh, and they were, you know, not, you know, relatively lean people trying to get leaner. And they used a pretty standard setup. One had a continuous energy restriction. On the other group, uh, every, after every five days of dieting, they would have two days of maintenance. They matched the total uh, energy restriction between groups. So they had like a 25% uh, caloric restriction. In the continuous group, 35%. And in the refeed group, so net over time, uh, they were trying to match energy. They kept resistance training throughout, uh, and they measured changes in body composition. Uh, they used, I think, what is a novel technique? I haven't seen it before, where they tried to uh, account for uh, any differences in body water between groups. So they calculated dry fat-free mass uh, by combining uh, their body comp measurements with, uh, I think, BIA to assess uh, body water. Um and they looked at changes in RMR as well to see if there's an impact on resting metabolic rate. And, um, you know, basically the findings were pretty straightforward. Um, you saw non-significant differences between groups uh, in fat mass and fat-free mass and uh, RMR. Uh, but there were significant reductions in, in uh, fat-free mass from pre to post in the non-refeed group. Uh, and there were uh, non-significant and significant reductions in RMR, but there were non-significant reductions in fat-free mass and RMR in the refeed group. And probably the, the most important aspect of it, there was one between group difference, and that was that uh, less dry, free, dry fat-free mass was lost in the refeed group. So on balance, you know, this is the first study of its kind. It's not like a huge sample size and certainly, you know, not without limitations, but it does absolutely lean, lean in the, uh, the direction of, of refeeds being beneficial, uh, for, for maintaining more lean body mass. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. That's the general summary. And of course, if you've got questions, I mean, there are some limitations. It's been out for a while. I think this came out back in, uh, you know, March or April, if I recall correctly. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been discussed. Some people have, uh, noted certain limitations, uh, but I know Eric, you're pretty familiar with the data as well. So I'll, I'll leave it there and see where we want to go with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, it. We might as well acknowledge what some of the main main limitations are that people have mm -hmm. pointed out. Uh, you know, there's the easy stuff. There's the sample size, right? Um, yep. But one of the things that a lot of people pointed out is, uh, you know, some of the changes were not significant between groups. So, like you mentioned, dry fat free mass was, but when they looked at the uh, typical fat free mass value unadjusted for for body water, and when they looked at resting metabolic rate. They found, uh, you know, something that was significant in one group, but not in the other, um, which is informative, but it's not the same as a between group mm -hmm. difference. So I'm, a after seeing some of the conversation unfold in the evidence-based fitness world, do you feel any differently about uh, the, the main takeaways from it? Do you still see these kind of two-day refeeds as being a reasonably justifiable approach for, you know, I, I kind of 
unintentionally implied that the the subjects were physique athletes they were not i'm sure some of them probably were but you know this was just kind of probably the the typical listener to the podcast you know a person who might not be a competitive physique athlete but generally is interested in some you know resistance training to get stronger change their body composition maybe stay on the leaner side so we don't have a lot of good research from people who are not a clinical population who are trying to go from kind of lean to leaner with resistance mm-hmm. training. So it, it's a good pot, a good sample for, you know, who usually actually utilizes this kind of research. So for those people, do you, do you still think a two day refeed is justifiable? Yeah, I, I do. I think it's, um, it's hard to look at this data and just dismiss, uh, some of those, you know, within versus between group differences as purely, you know, it's just the data was small sample size. We need longer. Um, you know, when you see a between group difference in, in one metric that goes in the same direction as the within group stuff, um, like now granted, if let's say the dry fat free mass was, was leaning in favor of the refeed group, but all the other metrics going the other way that in my first thought would be, you know, this is kind of an untested metric. I'm, I'm not sure of the validity of using this method of uh, assessing quote unquote dry fat free mass. It's not even going the same direction as fat free mass. This must be a water thing. And, and this didn't account for it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that everything kind of makes sense, you know, and, and it, it, it passes the logic test. You know, if, if RMR was impacted, uh, we both know that the, probably the biggest thing that's going to impact RMR is your fat-free mass. So if there was a, you know, a within group difference leaning in the direction of more fat-free mass retained, subsequently uh, greater RMR retained, and we see a between group difference with dry fat-free mass, I think that that, that tells you like, uh, you know, this is it, at very least, it's, it's absolutely not worse. And if anything, I would say uh, the data leans in the direction of refeeds being helpful. Um one other limitation I think is worth bringing up, and you know, this is pitched as a delimitation by the authors, in that they waited two days after the refeed to assess uh, changes in the refeed group to make sure that there wasn't, uh, you know, impact from glycogen and you know intramuscular water and things like that on the findings. Um, but the question is, uh, and I know I've heard some people bring this up. Well, what happened in those two days? Uh, could they have done something with their diet that would have you know caused those those changes? And I, I struggle with that because it's basically the same argument you'd have as if they were measured right after the refeed. You know, if they were eating more food than the other group, they could have maintained more muscle. Well, that's the whole reason we waited until after the refeed. You know, they weren't given an intervention or an instruction. Um, but, you know, the other group where they measured immediately after, it's not 100% clear. So I think uh, I think that that's probably the, the fairest uh, you know, critique is, Hey, we don't really know what, what happened, uh, in, in those two periods, other those two days, that period where, uh, the, the group that was refeeding was asked to, to hopefully wash out the effect of the refeeds. Um, so, you know, it, it's possible that that somehow had an impact, but I would think that the fact that they're assessing dry fat free mass are trying to account for water and that we're seeing the, these RMR changes. Um, I, I don't think a lot of that would be impacted by acute feeding that much. So, Nonetheless, I, I think absolutely there's, it's, it's totally justifiable to, to do refeeds. Um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, you know, we just have some funkiness going on with with the uh, the way the data cl- was collected in this and it biased uh, to show a benefit toward the refeed group. But I absolutely don't think it's masking like a negative effect uh, by any means. Yeah, I mean, looking at the values, you know, the, the continuous group lost 1.3 kilograms of fat-free mass, the refeed group only 0.4 looking at dry fat free mass negative 1.9 in the continuous group and then only negative 0.2 uh, in the refeed group and then the the drop in resting metabolic rate 78 calories in the continuous group and only 38 in the refeed group and so when you triangulate those they all seem to lean in the same direction and of course it you know those criticisms of the study are fair and valid so this is the type of thing where two very reasonable informed people can just walk away with different conclusions based on how much weight they want to put into the data from this study. But um, my question is, you know, when, when you get really rigid about finding a low P value for that between group comparison, and you're, you're like, no, it's got to be statistically significant. My question is, how big did you expect this effect to be? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I mean, like, w- when we're talking about just shifting the same total number of calories to a couple different days throughout the week, 
I mean, are, are you really expecting in small sample research like this that we're going to see three, four, five kilograms of, of lean mass preservation? So I, I think even though that between group comparison wasn't statistically significant, like you said, when you look at it at face value, it at least leans in that direction. And because of the lack of significance, I, I think you can have some some very reasonable back and forth and, and two informed people can walk away with a different interpretation of the data. But I think you and I see it pretty much eye to eye. Um, you know, I, I think it's a modest benefit leaning in favor of those refeeds. Will, will future research pan out the exact same way? Who knows? But uh, I know I'd certainly like to see it. I'm, I'm sure you feel the same. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think... I think there are, I think there's almost a meta discussion here as to what is a reasonable way to interpret data. And I think, I think if we want to do this appropriately, you know, even entering the conversation, let's say we've got two people who are, one's a little more conservative in their analysis. One is, uh, you know, more, more liberal, if you will. Um, as soon as we enter this conversation, we're both acknowledging this is the first study that exists. It has small sample sizes. Uh, and therefore there's already the ceiling comes far down on how excited we can get about this. I think anything beyond saying, oh, that's cool. Maybe refeeds are, are something, you know, it's not just the, the anecdotes of bodybuilders, which, which we have, we, we've actually seen, there's a study by Mitchell where qualitatively, uh, uh, a lot of bodybuilders were interviewed and said, Hey, refeeds seem to work really well for me. Okay. So it's beyond anecdotes. There's something leaning in that direction. Um, would be cool to see more research. I think that's about as positive you, you can get. Um, and given bodybuilders are already doing this, coaches are already doing this. Uh, we, we're not going to go like, Hey, by the way, everyone, you need to stop now until we have study two, you know, like I don't think anyone's saying that. Uh, but I think the conservative version is also quite reasonable. Like, you know, we only saw this, this one kind of semi-exploratory non-validated metric of fat-free mass that was truly significant between groups. Um, you know, we need more research. I think what you can't say is, uh, this is amazing. Everyone should be doing refeeds. It's going to preserve all your muscle mass. And you also can't say, uh, this study was, was horrendously flawed. Uh, and you know, this, this is a method that we can't know. They waited two days. And and I know for sure that this is just, you know, water weight masking, masking changes. Um, so in my opinion, so long as you're not in any one of those extremes, you're completely within the realm of, of reasonable interpretation of the data. Uh, but in either case, it, does, it doesn't take refeeds off the table or put them on some kind of pedestal. Definitely. You, you know, I, I think since you just kind of like cracked the door open to the anecdote zone, we need to go ahead and step all the way through. One of my criticisms of this study was that the refeed period was relatively short. Uh, in follow-up work, what I'd like to see discussed is... Uh, refeeds lasting months to years. So for me personally, Mm -hmm. I've been refeeding for about the last six years. And I got to say, it's going great. Uh, Lean mass, fine. Uh, Metabolic furnace burning as hot as can be conceived of. Uh, So that's how I personally feel about the whole refeed thing. Uh, And honestly, I think scientists are a bunch of cowards for uh, for not looking into that way to implement refeeds. So... A little bit of pushback. I think technically six years would be more of a diet break than a refeed (laughs) in in most, the working definition that most people have adopted. Um, But who knows? Maybe they'll look into that next. Do do the Matador study, six years of dieting, six years of a diet break on and off for 40 years or something. Um, Now, shifting gears a little bit, Mike, um, one one of the topics we speak about a lot on the podcast is the interference effect. We've got a lot of listeners who do some combination of resistance training and some type of cardiovascular training. And there's always some degree of concern about how to make those fit together uh, within a program and whether or not the interference effect is something that should be worried about. So uh, in volume four of mass, you had a great article about the interference effect. So why don't you take it away and give us a little rundown? Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm glad to hear this is something that you guys talk about quite a bit. Uh, I mean, that I listen to every episode, and I I uh, I know you talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this has been uh, this has actually been a topic of interest of mine 
uh, for about 12 years. It was the first uh, research topic that I was really ever interested in and one of the reasons that I wanted to go on and continue education uh, many years ago. So concurrent training is something that I really enjoy talking about, really enjoy writing about, and just learning about. So before I get into the study, just briefly, Trux, you mentioned that there are some listeners that you know might have some level of concern about including aerobic exercise with their resistance training, and that may attenuate hypertrophy or strength adaptations. And that's certainly a very valid concern. And what I hope to illustrate in the next few minutes after talking about the study briefly and then giving a more overall depiction of the concurrent training literature is that while those concerns are not invalid, you, and you will run into a point where there's this inevitable point where you have to kind of manage them a little bit and you might see, all right, I, I'm going to have to break some of the scientific rules a little bit to get in enough cardio if I'm dieting for a bodybuilding show or something like that. However, you can mitigate greatly the negative risk of cardio on these anaerobic adaptations as long as we go about things in a logical manner. So with that said, let's talk about this study and then get back to that term logical manner when implementing concurrent training. So the study that we looked at here and that I reviewed, which by the way is one of the best titles I believe I've ever come up with in mass, and I was very, very pleased to come up with this title. Um, not my best, but one of the best. And in this title, and in this article, there was a study that was done, it was on uh, members of the Danish military. And that's important because these members of the Danish military, in addition to the program that I'm going to outline for you in the study, they were doing hours of extra exercise and cardio and endurance training, just in addition to the what I'm going to lay out here. But the important findings are they still, while there were no difference between the three groups I'm going to lay out, they still got stronger in general and they still got bigger in general. So the three groups in the study of these Danish military members going through a basic training phase in the military, they had one of the groups which did two hours per week of running and strength training. Now, these two hours per week were broken up into two days, and they were done in what they called micro sessions. So 15 minutes of strength training here, 15 minutes of running here, and the running and lifting that were done on the same day were always separated by two hours, and it amounted to 60 minutes of lifting per week and 60 minutes of running per week, but in these 15-minute blocks. Another group did, in one session, 30 minutes of running, and 30 minutes of lifting, and they did that twice per week. So running and lifting together, that amounted to an hour. And then another group did 60 minutes of lifting one day, and then essentially 60 minutes of running one day. So all of that amounted to the same time, but the sessions, as you can see from that, that's not a lot of lifting. And there was maybe five, six sets of the main exercises per week, and the endurance exercise was running. It wasn't cycling, it wasn't something low impact, it was running. In general, Strength increased on a, a variety of exercises, maximal voluntary contraction, pull-ups, things like that. And they did that not only with the low volume of resistance training they were doing, but again, with the hours of extra basic training that they were doing. So no differences between groups here, but the takeaway from this that I, I like to portray is that I'm not telling you to go and lift weights in this manner if your main goals are strength and hypertrophy. In fact, you shouldn't. You're going to need more volume. You're not going to want to do anywhere close to this type of aerobic training. But I think it does help to demonstrate the point that these individuals got stronger. They tended to get bigger. So if you're someone who thinks, hey, I'm going to do a couple sessions of cardio or I'm going to run once or twice and oh my God, it's all over then that's not the case, right? This is good news that, oh, wow, that isn't going to necessarily crush all of my gains, if you will. Now, on the other side of it, it's not to say it didn't interfere at all. We can't technically conclude if there's an interference effect here because there was no group that just lifted weights, but we do have enough other evidence to know or to suggest pretty strongly if there was a group that did only lift weights 
they would have better adaptations than all these others. So to use that term interference effect now as we go to the more broad uh, discussion, which is what Trex used, is to say that term interference effect comes from the fact that if you lift weights, and then in general, if you add in some type of long duration aerobic exercise, I'm not talking about sprinting, I'm just giving a long duration steady state cardio for a long period of time, and you add that into your lifting, the your strength and hypertrophy and power should then be attenuated or the rate of increase should be lower. And that comes from a meta-analysis that was published almost 10 years ago now and some a few follow-ups since then. That principle is pretty well established. But the most important thing, and I use the term kind of the logic earlier or implementing things in a logical manner, is when we talk about these old studies that are done on concurrent training, they are designed to show the interference effect. So the first study from Hickson in 1980 showed the interference effect. I think Helms was there for that data collection. You might have been a subject. And so in that study, Hickson had three groups. They had a group over 10 weeks that only did endurance training, had a group that did strength training, lifted weights five days per week, and a group that did endurance, and then a group that did concurrent training, which simply lifted weights five days per week and did endurance training six days per week. Now, that study showed that the there was about half the increase in strength and hypertrophy in the group that did concurrent training versus the group that did strength training over the 10 weeks. Now, in that study, the concurrent and the strength group actually increased strength and hypertrophy to about the same extent for the first five or six weeks, and it was really the latter half of the study where there, there was the interference effect. But that's what the interference effect is, is when that aerobic exercise interferes with the anaerobic adaptations. So, But in that study, though, when I say studies are designed to show the interference effect, think about that. One group lifted weights five days per week, and then the concurrent training group just did that and and ran and cycled six days per week on top of it. That's extreme. That's not what most of us are doing when we're incorporating cardio. We're talking about two days a week here, three days per week here, maybe four days per week as you're getting more into it. Some of those sessions are sprinting and not just moderate intensity cardio and that type of thing. So I think it's analogous to if you look at one of the, the early studies that look at static stretching and performance, it shows a decrease of strength. But individuals held stretches for 100 seconds. Right? Of course that's going to have a negative effect. Of course concurrent training is going to have a negative effect if you're adding six days of running on top of five days of lifting. So I think when we think about things logically, we can start to mitigate this. So some of the things that meta-analyses and individual studies have shown is, all right, there's this, let's say, wide gap. Let's say you're, you're going to increase strength and hypertrophy you know, um, by about a hundred percent more, you know, double the gains in some of these studies, um, when you have these, you know, intense concurrent training bouts. But if you reduce the duration of that, let's say from 60 minutes of endurance training at a time to 30 minutes at a time, you reduce the frequency from six days a week to three days per week. That difference of concurrent training to strength training alone decreases really, really rapidly. And there's not that much difference anymore. Then, when you say, hey, I want to choose cycling instead of running, running has a strong eccentric component, it's creating a lot of damage, cycling does not, a little bit more low impact, the difference between performing concurrent training and strength training alone becomes even lower. When we're just talking about strength and hypertrophy, those things tend to be less impacted than something like power adaptations. So I think concurrent training would be more harmful for a high power athlete rather than just a power lifter or a bodybuilder. Not to mention the actual benefits that you're getting from the concurrent training if you're a bodybuilder that's looking to lean out or a power lifter that needs to make a weight class. So when constructing a program logically, I think we can work around this pretty well. There's a, a few different kind of hypotheses and mechanisms that can account for this, um, but we can avoid this. So if you go in, if there's some data and we've collected in our lab as well. If you're cycling three days per week for 30 minutes at 50% VO2 max, I would I would challenge anybody and I would say, do you really think that's going to harm your strength gains? If you squat and deadlift and do lower body work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you do that cycling Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday for 30 minutes at a low intensity or a moderate intensity, do you really believe that's going to harm your strength gains? And I would say that the answer is no. Certainly if you start to do that now for 60 minutes at a time or 90 minutes at a time, maybe some of that bleeds into it. But when you look at your programming, 
I think one of the things you can do is try and program logically. Try and keep, for the most part, the cardio work 24 hours away from the lower body strength work. Don't do it on the same day. Don't do it in the morning and then, then squat later in the day. If you have to put on the same day as lifting, maybe you bench press in the morning and then you cycle later in the day. That shouldn't be an issue. If you are concerned that, let's say, you typically get your cardio in Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday and squat Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, but on Friday you have a heavy squat, move that Thursday uh, cardio session over to Sunday. And then you get it away from the heavy squat on Friday. Maybe you have volume squats on Monday, but volume shouldn't be as affected from 30 minutes of uh, cycling as a, a heavy squat would be 24 hours later. The point being, if you just look at how to configure your training program, you consider the duration of the cardio, you consider the modality of the cardio, you consider the frequency of the cardio. If you're a bodybuilder, let's say, or a power lifter, your goal isn't cardio performance. Your goal is the caloric expenditure. Your goal is to become leaner from that. So where you can get into trouble with concurrent training is if you have dual performance goals. You have a performance goal in, you know, you want to train for a 5K or a longer distance, and you want to train to become the best power lifter that you can be. Unfortunately, at some point, you're then going to run into an issue where you're not going to get the most out of your ability in one of them, and you'd have to make a choice. But if you don't have performance goals, and you're just doing it for the sake of, hey, caloric expenditure and becoming lean, then you have a lot of leeway to configure all of those things, duration, modality, frequency, and where it goes in around your programming to be able to, do, to, to put that in there. The other aspect to discuss, I would say briefly, is uh, a lot of people, especially, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 years ago now, some of you guys may be more up on the time frame in the bodybuilding community, were all about HIT. And I think HIT is still a tool that is can be used, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people still use it. However, I would question the use of uh, solely using HIT for, for cardio. Just because if you think of what takes mentally more energy to do, uh, you, you're doing a bunch of sprints for 30 minutes after a long day of work, or you're doing a moderate intensity cycling session. So I think in, in those cases, while HIT might be ideal or scientifically ideal, it's not always the practical choice, not to mention the muscle damage that might come along with those sprints if you're unaccustomed to it, and then that could bleed into your session the next day. So something with cardio too is to always keep in mind you can use a flexible template for this. Hey, I have to get in 12 sessions of cardio over the next month. I want the client to do four hit sessions, um, but the rest of them can be moderate intensity, just get them in. So I think there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack there and there's still more to discuss, but the bottom line is for anybody that is concerned about this, I think that yes, just on paper, looking at the results of a meta-analysis or an individual study, it looks kind of damning. It looks, oh my God, I'm going to be in some serious trouble if I do some cardio. But when you understand that most of these studies are designed to show the interference effect because they have such an extreme concurrent training or cardio intervention, if you take all of those factors into account and program it logically as we stated, I think you'll be just fine. So Mike, I, I think you raised some really good points uh, that definitely warrant further discussion. But one of the things you just very briefly mentioned that uh, I, I definitely think we should get into that might have actually come as a pretty big surprise to a lot of our listeners is just how old Eric Helms is. Uh, so is, is there anything else you'd like to say about that just to, to kind of expand on that topic? You know, it's, it's hard, Greg. Um, at this point, I, I think we should just go around the horn here. We'll start with, with you, Greg. Would you like to reintroduce yourself to Eric? Cause he, for after about 15 minutes, his memory goes, <laughs> If we could, if we could do that, you know, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we can get back to that portion of the show later, but he's been, he's been around for, for quite some time here. You know, he was a subject in that study. Um, and, uh, it, it was, it was great to, to hear about that. I, he, he was telling me once, although he, his, since his memory goes, but he did tell me a few years back what it was like watching Babe Ruth play. He said he was as good as, as as everybody says these days, which was really great to hear, said he was was a nice guy. He was actually thinner than uh, than you see in the movie. If you've watched uh, the movie that came out in the '90s, said he was a bit thinner than that. So that's good to hear. Eric, are you are you Eric? Eric, are you still there? Yeah. So <laughs> I view Helms. Does anybody watch uh, ESPN College Game Day when when they like before all the college football games they make their picks and kind of preview the games? Yeah. I view Helms as our 
Lee Corso. You know, we, <laughs> you know, his, I mean, his reputation speaks for itself. We have to help him along through the broadcast a little bit from time to time. But Lee, to his credit, is perfect on his picks this year when, when he picks the winner of the big game at the end. So I think Helms is, he's still doing a great job. It's just sometimes we got to, support him a little bit well i i really appreciate the level of self-awareness he shows how he kind of brands himself as captain america because right before our eyes uh as the ravages of time really just eat away at him we're seeing him transition from captain america the first avenger to uh steve rogers at the end of endgame uh right in front of our eyes and and you know, it, it gives us some perspective about what time is going to do to all of us. Uh, and just the fact that Eric is is showing us the direction that path takes about 40 years before any of the rest of us are going to get there. Uh, I, I really appreciate him for it. You know, Omar, I, I totally agree. And I think this is probably <laughs> going to be one of our, our best episodes of Iron Culture. Um, so, yeah, I just thanks for having me on uh, on Sigma Nutrition Radio, Danny. I appreciate that. No, no. So, so Mike, actual serious question. Uh, and mostly I'm just kicking this over to you because uh, probably half a dozen people have asked it on the Q&A form for the Stronger by Science podcast. And I don't care about it enough to attempt to answer it. Uh, and I think you might actually be able to answer it pretty well. So uh, thus far, we've been talking about people whose primary goal is lifting and they want to add some cardio in either just to burn some calories, to get in better shape, to feel better, whatever. Um, Several people have asked though, like, okay, my primary goal is running and I want to start doing some lifting, uh, you know, to build some muscle, get a little bit stronger, but primarily with a goal of supporting my cardiovascular training and being able to run faster, bike faster and farther, et cetera. Um, So kind of from the opposite perspective how would you go about setting up training for someone who primarily has cardiovascular goals but does also want to do some lifting as well yeah i actually uh am very interested in in answering this question so from the other side of it and it, it's a, <clears throat> it's a really good point just because in this world in the lifting world if you will we, whenever we hear the term concurrent training, we automatically, you know, <clears throat> people get scared, go, ah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get weak. And that's the reaction. I think they, they do that too. I could do it again. I think Greg's laughing at me right now, but they go, <laughs> ah, just like that. The, the, the fear is palpable. It is. And, um, so I can see Helms looking over the shoulder. I think the access van is coming to pick him up right now. Take him. <laughs> And so in this world, that's kind of our reaction. But in the aerobic exercise world, when you hear concurrent training, remember the immediate thought would be the opposite, which is now I'm incorporating lifting for my running. What impact is this going to have? And what's funny is it's when we think of it in the lifting world too, we're always thinking of it not because anybody has any interest in running performance or cycling performance, but because how can this, I can, how can I use this as a tool to make me leaner? And in the running world, nobody's thinking of it for any reason other than how can I lift weights to make me faster? And so they're always thinking about lifting from helping them from a performance perspective. And so in that way, I think it's a really interesting um, kind of way to view it. But so the data is very clear that resistance training can be extraordinarily helpful for running performance. The only real physiological downside to lifting weights for running is if you're lifting weights, let's say like a bodybuilder and you're putting on too much muscle mass and this is, you know, causing you to carry more weight. That's certainly going to be a negative, uh, certainly after a certain point for running performance, but for runners, the data is very clear uh, that resistance training can help running performance. But again, the resistance training should be as specific as it can be for those runners. So when people hear that term resistance training, they think sometimes you're lifting, oh man, I don't want to get big. So the basic guidelines, something like two to three times a week for runners, keeping the exercises certainly mostly focused on the lower body, doesn't mean you shouldn't be neglecting the upper body, but mostly focused on the lower body, that are a mix of explosive but also it's okay, and, and this is what I, I think some runners miss on this. They think, oh, I don't want to lift too heavy, so I'm going to perform 
you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 reps and stay a few reps shy of failure. Well, now you're doing hypertrophy training. So this should probably be things like split squats and the sets of four, five, six, things like that. Maybe a, a couple reps shy of failure. You're not doing too much volume. Um, a lot of supersets in there, not necessarily for the cardiovascular benefit because you're getting that, but just from a time efficiency perspective, because if you're doing something like a split squat, you can do some sort of core work at the same time while you're doing that. You've probably already run, depending on the uh, what you're training for, 8, 10, 12, 15 miles for some of these runners early in the morning, and then you're getting in 30, 45 minutes of resistance training two, three times a week, a week later in the day. So it's a mix of explosive resistance training and heavier resistance training, avoiding the high volume work, um, split squats, some step ups, even squats with the barbell, goblet squats are okay as well. Front squats are used a lot in the running community as well. Uh, even deadlifts, things from the floor, the exercise selection can be kind of similar, although I would make sure to get some sort of unilateral work in there. I think that's important. Um, but it's okay to do those bilateral movements as well, um, keeping those reps kind of low a couple times a week. Easy way to mix in core work, whether it's uh, you know, planks, whether it's, you know, holding in a crunch position, uh, uh, you know, with weights for a while, some isometric core work that a lot of runners do, um, a lot of extra hamstring work that runners will do as well. One leg RDLs are a common exercise. Uh, so all of those things can be mixed in there, but resistance training is very helpful for runners. There's a couple meta-analyses on this, systematic reviews, and a bunch of original research that really started coming out about 15 years ago. Um, helps improve stride length, running economy, maintenance of stride length throughout the length of uh, a 5K in one really good study um, where they use some motion capture to look at stride length, improve running times, and then some pretty good runners. So um, my recommendation is a couple times a week, not high volume, um, keeping the, the sessions relatively short overall, keeping it explosive and keeping the weights pretty low, mixing in some unilateral work. Uh, and, and, and just again, just kind of like the other concurrent training, configuring it. So if you have a long run or you have what runners would call a workout or a speed work the next day, you know, you're not doing something too damaging the day before that. A lot of distance runners, most of their work is actually what they call easy running. And so you would perform it uh, a day before that or on an easy running day, which would make it a bit easier to be prepared for the long run. So relatively low volume, heavy stuff, explosive stuff, get your your unilateral work in and uh, just make sure it doesn't come right before one of your, your faster workouts. Absolutely. Zordos, before we move on to another topic, I do have two really quick follow-up questions. Um, the first one, what about modality? Um, on my Instagram, somebody posted a question about this. My Instagram, by the way, is blowing up. I mean, it's it's mental over there. People are saying that some of my content is too hot for Instagram. Actually, Omar has been saying that a lot. I'm starting to get worried about it, that they're going to be shutting me down soon. But over on the Instagram, someone asked, where does rowing fit in? And, and like, how do you, when, when we talk about making that cardio choice based on the interference effect, running, cycling, rowing, how do those factor in? I think it's a great question. So I'm going to first give a response that's not going to be super helpful, at least not today, but I hope down the road it is. Um, it's mainly the response that I usually give my students in class when, when they ask this question, because this is a very common question and one that I should have addressed, which is if you understand this conceptually, then think about the recommendations we gave between running and cycling, think what rowing is more similar to, and then how that might affect things. So, so my first part of that is to say, hey, think conceptually, and then we can kind of break this down and understand it. But to give a more direct answer that will be more helpful is, first of all, if you row, now you, let's say you jump on a rowing machine at the gym, this is mostly your upper body working. So now, instead of your lower body being affected, now you have to configure this around your upper body training. Because again, the modality of cardio only matters in that you want to choose the one that's least likely to negatively affect your strength and size. So rowing might fit a bit with cycling, and we think of that there isn't necessarily going to be the impact. Now, if you're 
depending on how much resistance that you put on, you might see some of this. But again, with the imp with the resistance on rowing, you're getting that resistance on the concentric portion and not as much on the eccentric portion. So you're not getting as much damage as let's say running would. So while rowing might fit more along the lines of something like cycling, the difference is that rowing is going to affect the upper body. So the recommendations that we gave earlier for how to fit the cycling in around the squat, let's say we said Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're cycling, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're squatting. In this case, we might say Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're rowing, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're benching. Perfect. And I did have another follow-up question. Um, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I'm pretty sure Zordo spent a great deal of time uh, kind of bragging about the title to his article. Did you ever actually say the title? I, I'm pretty sure you just mentioned how great it was and blew right by it. It's it's a it's what they call a teaser, Eric. And so now to get the title, they will need to subscribe to Mass. So perhaps Man, that's that's good marketing. That's it is. that's good stuff. It is. You said um, your Instagram is blowing up. Have you seen mine? I actually haven't. I, I don't think anyone's seen your Instagram. That's that's because they already shut it down, unlike Trexus. Yeah. Well, you have to compete with my titles. I had one that was shedding some light on vitamin D. That was, I mean, that people are going you, wild you, over you, that. Your, uh, um, the cherry, and it had uh, uh, had sweet in the title toward the end. Yep. That was, yeah. that was perhaps cherries, my favorite. Sweet yes. effects on recovery. I had... Uh, capsaicin the ho the hottest supplement on the market That's i mean good. i i think you might have oversold can, your title a can, little bit can i submit i I, per I personally think the best and and not to flex too hard here was mine that was uh splish splash i was taking a salty bath to that, cut weight was i wasting my time that was that was that was excellent what hold on okay i i need to shut the whole the whole sh sh this whole thing down because before Trexler even joined, yeah, uh, I was strongly pushing for Mass's title itself to just stop, simply stop. be no, applications no, and strength it. sport. Don't I, I, applications and strength sport because I think it gives us more flexibility when we when we release. These guys were were too afraid <laughs> of the acronym that would follow that. I I wasn't. I didn't blink in the face of controversy. So let's just say you got your titles of of these articles. I had a title for Mass. That would have broke the internet. Just no, that, that would have there. been, it, it would have been a, a branding issue with me. It, it would have caused confusion. Uh, my my preferred metric for normalized strength scaling instead of Wilk score is allometrically scaled strength. So I've been talking about the ass coefficient for years. Uh, and if I put out <laughs> a product that was also called ass, uh, one, I'm afraid people would get confused. Two, I'm afraid Bet Brett Contreras would sue me. Uh, and I just didn't want that smoke personally. May I, may I submit for consideration? Um, we out here talking about practice, man. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. was, that was a pretty that, good title. That I, was a yeah. good one. That, that's that's my. I feel that's my runaway winner for myself. Anytime you're bringing Allen Iverson into the equation, you're you're gonna be feeling good about your position. Listen, Trex. I don't know no two time MVP to come off the bench. I don't know no five-time All-Star to come off the bench, no first-time, seven-time, first-time all, first-team All-NBA to come off the bench. This is another great one by him. What was most impressive to me is that he knew all those stats. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know any, most of the time I, I, players are like, I don't know I was first-team All-NBA. He knew all the stats, and he was just toasting Larry Brown about coming off the bench, and... uh you know, but to his to to his point, I also don't know anybody else who is a seven time first team All NBA that comes off the bench. Uh, I I think uh, Alonzo Mourning did pretty late in his career when he was with Miami. Yeah, I, I just enjoy the uh, Zoe LJ teams back in Charlotte. Those were the days, honestly, with uh, with Muggsy Bogues in the mix as well. I, I was a good NBA Jam team as well, dude. So we might have to cut this. I don't know if the language here is PC. Uh, but have you heard the story about how Michael Jordan completely ruined Muggsy Bogues' three-point shot? No. Did he do it on the set of Space Jam? No, he did it in a playoff game. So C Can you censor the, the questionable language, uh, make it a, a more PC version? I mean, not really, because they don't <laughs> want to be as funny. That would take all the fun out of it. It would also reduce the editing time and lead to fewer <laughs> continuity issues as the person who edits the audio. 
okay, whatever. I'll I'll give it a shot. So anyway, Muggsy Bogues was a basically average three point shooter through much of his career. Uh, and then Charlotte was in the playoffs one time. They ran into Jordan's Bulls, uh, and relatively late in the game, I think the Bulls were either up two or three. And Muggsy had a chance to shoot a three, either to tie the game or to pull ahead. Uh, and the closest defender to him was Michael Jordan. And he he would have had like a 10, 12 foot closeout. Um, but <laughs> instead of trying to contest the shot at all, he just stares down Muggsy and just yells at him, shoot it, you f***. And uh, Muggsy completely airballs it and was a very below three below average three point shooter the entire rest of his career. Like it just completely broke his psyche, uh, which not necessarily condoning uh, the language that Michael Jordan used there uh, could be seen as discriminatory against short people, uh, which I know Zordos is very sensitive about. Uh, but just the fact that some in-game trash talk completely changed the statistical profile of a professional athlete for the entire rest of their career, that's that's elite shit talking. All right. <laughs> I think that's a great way to transition into our next topic. Um, I love how you just served us right into that easy segue, Greg. That was terrific. Um, so, Greg, let's talk myonuclear domain theory, um, <laughs> building off our previous comments. Uh, so, you had this is something we've talked about on the podcast. We had uh, Alex Coliari Turner on, who, who's done some research in this area, uh, some really fascinating stuff. But uh, in volume four of mass, you reviewed a study uh, about myonuclear domain theory and muscle memory. So uh, why don't you give us a rundown uh, of what the study looked at? Yeah. So the, the title of the study I looked at was the concept of muscle memory evidence from animal and human studies by Snyder's and colleagues. Uh, and so basically this was looking at uh, what's called myonuclei facilitated muscle memory. And so the, the basic model of this is, is that hypertrophy occurs as muscle hypertrophy occurs myonuclei are added to the muscle uh, and then when muscle atrophy occurs all myonuclei are uh, retained and so that's called myonuclear permanence uh, and then upon retraining since all of those myonuclei are still there uh, myonuclear density is higher and that increases translational capacity or in other words basically per unit of volume for each muscle fiber, uh, more muscle protein can be synthesized, leading to faster hypertrophy. Uh, and basically, under this model, rapid hypertrophy would slow back down when you reach your maximum myonuclear domain size, which should roughly correspond to your all-time biggest. So essentially, muscle memory is being accomplished by having the, the myonuclei there to preserve translational capacity. So when you start lifting again, uh, you can basically get back to your all-time biggest relatively quickly before it actually starts becoming relatively challenging to start building muscle again. Um, and so th that's the basic idea. And what they did in this article, which was a review article, uh, is they pulled together all of the animal and human studies uh, that um, basically examined myonuclear content after muscle atrophy to see whether myonuclear permanence was a thing. Uh, and I'll note here that most of the animal studies were longitudinal. So looking at changes in fiber size and changes in myonuclear density over time in the same animal. Uh, most of the studies in humans are cross-sectional. So basically comparing fiber size and myonuclear density in young versus older humans because uh, humans live a lot longer than mice and you don't necessarily want to do a 50-year study uh, on the same topic. Uh, and they also discussed some individual studies that were actually relevant to kind of the whole concept of muscle memory. Um, so for example, they looked at some studies uh, where basically they looked at myonuclear domain size at baseline and looked to see if people with smaller baseline myonuclear domains did build muscle faster than people with larger myonuclear domains because that would be kind of conceptually similar to having smaller myonuclear domains after muscle atrophy. Uh, so basically studies that didn't necessarily look at the entire uh, muscle memory model, uh, but but one individual part of it. Um, so there's there was a lot going on in this review article, uh, but, but I'm going to keep this pretty high level. 
The big picture for myonuclear permanence is that uh, it seems that myonuclei are lost at a slower rate than muscle atrophy itself occurs, but they're probably not actually permanent. So for example, if you take a few months off training uh, and you lose a, consider a considerable amount of muscle mass, at that point, all or most of your myonuclei are probably still sticking around. Uh, so you can you can regain the muscle you lost pretty quickly. But if you take several years off of training, that that's probably long enough to have lost uh, some of your myonuclei. So you probably wouldn't be able to easily get all the way back to where you'd been previously. Um, and it, you know, if you took decades off of training, you might be essentially starting back from square one, at least from a from a myonuclei perspective. Um, there's also some evidence that the rate of myonuclei loss may be faster at, at greater ages. So basically, if, uh, if you're me or Trex or Mike and we took a year off training, we'd probably be fine. Whereas if Helms took a year off training, he'd be in, uh, in really tough shit. Um, and then from, from a big picture for the whole concept of myonuclei mediated muscle memory, a lot of that is based on one study, which which very deservedly made waves because uh, it, it tells a really clear story, I would say. Uh, so there was a 2013 study by Egner and colleagues where essentially what they did uh, is they had two groups of mice and they implanted a testosterone releasing pellet in half of them. Uh, and in the other half, they implanted a sham pellet uh, for two weeks. So they had those pellets in for two weeks, they removed them, and then they basically had three weeks where nothing was going on, and they just monitored them for those uh, three weeks. And then uh, they finished it off with a two-week period of uh, like overload-induced hypertrophy, and they induced that overload via synergist ablation. So they were looking at uh, hypertrophy of the extensor digitorum longus in the mice, and I think they, they removed part of the mouse's soleus, uh, if memory serves. So basically r removing a synergist. So the muscle left is, is just like receiving more work in kind of day-to-day -day mouse activities. Uh, and so what they saw is that during the two weeks of testosterone administration, uh, fiber size and myonuclei content increased in the mice that were given testosterone. And obviously nothing happened in the, in the mice that were given the sham pellet during the three weeks off in the mice previously given testosterone, Muscle fiber size decreased to the point that it was pretty comparable to the to the mice that had been given a sham pellet, but myonuclear density uh, remained elevated. It was maintained uh, in spite of the fact that uh, muscle fiber size was lost. And then during the two week overload period, uh, mice previously given testosterone grew approximately twofold more than the mice who had not previously been given testosterone, uh, and so. That, that basically seems to, to flesh out the entire um, myonuclei-mediated muscle memory concept. Uh, but one thing to note about that study uh, is that it, it's, hard to, it's hard to completely square the difference in myonuclear density between the two groups of mice with the amount of overload-induced hypertrophy at the end of the study. So, so this is a direct quote from my mass article. Uh, following the three weeks of muscle atrophy in the group of mice that previously received testosterone, their muscle fibers were the same size as the mice that had received the sham treatment and their myonuclear density, uh, myonuclei, myonuclei per millimeter of fiber length, was approximately 15% greater. Following two weeks of overload, fiber growth was roughly two folds greater in the mice that had previously received testosterone. So, just using rough numbers, if a 15% greater myonuclear density can increase transcriptional capacity by 15%, but you're attempting to explain a roughly 100% difference in hypertrophy, some other mechanisms must be accounting uh, for the remaining 85% difference in hypertrophy. Thus, retaining myonuclei following atrophy may be a mechanism of muscle memory, but it can't be the only mechanism and it's likely to not be the most important mechanism. So I, I think that's uh, th that sums up the muscle memory bit pretty well. So basically, uh, myonuclei do seem to be lost at a slower rate than just total muscle tissue, but they're probably not permanent. And I do think they do. I, I do think they likely contribute to muscle memory to some degree, but I don't think they are the explanatory factor. I, I think there's probably something else or. 
uh, probably more accurately, multiple other things going on explaining the phenomenon of muscle memory. Uh, one that we know about is epigenetic modification. So there was a study by Seaborn and colleagues that we've also uh, looked at in mass that found some epigenetic changes uh, following resistance training that were retained upon detraining and probably contributed to increased rates of hypertrophy when people retrained. Uh, so yeah, you know, myonuclei may play a role. Epigenetic modifications probably play a role. And there are probably other things that we simply don't know about yet that play a role. But I, I do think the, the whole concept of myonuclei-mediated muscle memory uh, it, it, it is probably a little bit too simplistic. And I think people might have a little bit too much faith in it as the one and only or even primary driving cause of the phenomenon of muscle memory. Would you say that your perspective has changed a lot on myonuclear domain theory over the last few years as, as more of this research has come out? I, I would say so. I, I used to be a lot more confident in the whole concept of uh, myonuclear permanence. Um, so th there, there had previously been some studies looking at uh, say like spinal injury and found that like, oh, if you have extreme muscle atrophy following spinal injury, some myonuclei were lost. But all of the stuff that I had seen basically looking at atrophy caused by inactivity tended to show that myonuclei were, were retained pretty well. Uh, so I, I think just that area of research has fleshed out quite a bit in recent years. And, you know, n now we're seeing that the concept of myonuclear permanence, even under like quote unquote normal circumstances, isn't quite as solid as we may have previously thought it was. Um, and also like, you know, n now we know that epigenetics are probably uh, contributing to, to muscle memory as well. Uh, and, and I'm just less confident that uh, the myonuclei stuff is the driver of the whole muscle memory concept. Like, I, I do still think it contributes, but I don't think it's like the one and only or even the primary explanatory factor. Yeah, I mean, and we, we rarely see that, right, in, in physiology where where things are, are quite that simple, where there's one single driver that explains all of it. And I, I think that kind of relates to why the initial... Uh, concept was so appealing right it, it was mm -hmm. very tidy and clean and simplistic and straightforward so uh you know i was in the same boat i was like cool the whole picture is explained very concisely that sounds great to me um but, but it has gotten a little bit more complicated a, as more of this research has trickled out that's something that gets repeated in in science a lot not to be too meta um it's what what daniel kahneman calls what you see is all there is uh, the idea that when we have an observed phenomenon, but we don't have a mechanism to understand it, once we get even a glimmer of a picture of some something, it takes on far more weight than we have evidence to justify. And I think um, that's probably a good reminder for anyone who is reading some of these more, I'm not going to say fringe science because it almost delegitimizes it, but I would say the edge of what's been explored once we're trying to understand unknown processes, I think it's really helpful just to remind ourselves, we know about maybe one tenth of all the different physiological things that are going on. Um, so, you know, anytime we think we understand what's going on, we need to re retain that level of uh, speculativeness that is appropriate because it's easy to lump it all together. Um, one example, and I'll shut up. Like be, once we figured out that there are different types of fibers, and I, if you looked at this uh, back in the 80s and 90s, we started attributing a lot of things to type 1 and type 2 fibers based on a very limited understanding of them and saying, oh, this is the main mechanism before we understood about stiffness, uh, before we understood that just because there was a faster contractile velocity doesn't mean that force is actually higher per per, per square unit of uh, fiber, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, just a little aside, something I've been thinking about while you were talking. No, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And honestly, uh, like I mentioned, the clues were there in the Egner study itself. Uh, like th there was a 15% difference in myonuclear density and a twofold difference in hypertrophy. So uh, unless you're also proposing that if there is a slight elevation in myonuclear density, th the transcriptional capacity of those myonuclei also increases like sixfold. Uh, it, it's hard to completely bridge that gap, you know? Um, so like the, uh, uh, the ability to push back against this concept was there in the data itself. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I think like everyone just missed it, myself included, like not throwing shade at anyone. I definitely used to be way, way too confident in this concept. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're completely right. Like we, we as a community observed uh, muscle memory. And uh, I, I also think like a lot of people were used to say like, oh, it's complete bro science. Like we don't have evidence to support this. And then as soon as there was a little shred of evidence, uh, we wanted to say like, yeah, fuck you. Like my observations weren't wrong. This is a real thing. Now science proves it. And here's exactly what's going on. Like you, you, you want to have excessive confidence to be able to push back at people who had previously been saying you were wrong. Uh, and, and yeah, I think uh, a lot of people, myself included, just got uh, a little bit too swept up in it. Now, Helms, what was that phrase that you used there? What you see is all there is. What you see is all there is. So for my humble contribution to this conversation, I want to talk about a few studies where what you see is not what it is. Okay, so I, I covered <laughs> uh, a few meta-analyses in 2020. To me, 2020 was the year of the meta-analysis for, for my mass writing. There were quite a few metas that I read and basically reconstructed. Um, so I, I did a meta-analysis on carnitine, one on arginine, and another on vitamin D. And I don't want to take up too much time in this conversation because I want to make sure we really uh, make use of our time with our uh, esteemed guests here. But the reason that I bring it up is for all three of those meta-analyses, looking through it, there were some pretty straightforward uh, choices made in the analysis that that I felt kind of undermined the results. Uh, so uh, I don't want to be excessively critical, but but there are some things that if you go by the book, they, they probably ought to have been handled differently in order to have a more robust calculation involved in the meta-analysis. So going through them, a few of the things that really jumped out to me, double counting. So using multiple data points from the same study without accounting for that, uh, or I, I should say from the same participants, right? So if one study is measuring the impact of a supplement and they measure bench press and it works, those participants contributed one data point, their bench press results. Now, if they happen to measure bench press and squat, should that study have twice as much bearing on the overall results of the meta-analysis? Uh, theoretically, no. You know, we're, we're basically looking at the same effect, but counting it twice. And so we need to make sure we account for the fact that that is just one group of people who had a strength increase in that study. So double counting is when you're using multiple outcomes from the same individual, and therefore you're giving those individuals a little bit more influence on the meta-analysis than they should otherwise have. A couple other things that came up in some of these is not accounting for the effects of time. So if we're looking at something like soreness or uh, a biomarker of muscle damage, and we're looking at it immediately after exercise, and then 24 and 48 and 72 and 96 hours later, we need to account for the fact that those came from the same person, but we also need to account for the fact that we do expect to change over time. You know, we, we can't treat those as if they're equivalent data because they're not, right? So uh, soreness at baseline before exercise is done, it probably ought to be zero and it probably shouldn't be too variable if everybody followed the pre-visit instructions. So uh, not accounting for those time effects, which can be done mathematically. Another thing that came up is in some instances, making the mistake of treating standard errors as if they're standard deviations and vice versa. And that can have a remarkably huge impact on the effect sizes that, that you see in the study. And so there were quite a few meta-analyses I reviewed where they would say um, like, hey, we were looking at this body of literature and we noticed that there was extreme heterogeneity and wildly asymmetrical funnel plots. Anyway, here's the results. <laughs> and like they, they didn't go forward and say like, okay, well, why was there extreme heterogeneity and why were the funnel plots chaotically asymmetrical? And in most of the cases, it's because it, one or two or three of the effect sizes were calculated using a standard error that was being treated as a standard deviation. And so we saw these, you know, astronomically huge effect sizes that were getting lumped into the analysis and really throwing off the actual calculated effect size and introducing all of these, um, you know, factors of funnel plot asymmetry and heterogeneity and, and really undermining the, the robustness and the legitimacy of the pooled effect size that's calculated. So 
without getting super deep into the details, you know, I, I met, I looked at a meta-analysis on carnitine in 2020, uh, in, in one of our issues of mass and my results, uh, after accounting for some of those things, the effect of time and double counting and correlations b between repeated measures after accounting for those things, the results were far different. A, a number of P values changed from significant to non-significant. Uh, and, and it really painted a different picture of the results. Uh, same thing goes for the meta-analysis about arginine. Um, you know, th there were some some effect sizes that were that were miscalculated, and uh, for the arginine one, no, the, the vitamin D one I looked at, there was a pooled effect size of two point one four as a Cohen's d value that was statistically non-significant in a meta-analysis. And <laughs> I mean, anytime you see that, you got to look deeper and say, what happened here? So for for the carnitine one, for the arginine one, and for the vitamin D one after accounting for some of these fundamental principles of how these meta-analyses should be conducted, the results changed in a meaningful way. The practical takeaways actually changed from recalculating them after accounting for some of those really key considerations in the analyses. So my takeaway from this was that after seeing, I think it was like three out of four metas that I reviewed, where if you went back and crunched the numbers with some of those factors considered, the actual conclusion of the study changed. My take-home point was, unfortunately for now, I think the hierarchy of evidence that has those meta-analyses perched at the top, I think that applies to sports nutrition and exercise science in theory, but not necessarily in practice. There, there are far more meta-analyses that I see published in our area that have objectively inverted conclusions. Uh, and, and so that's not what we want to put at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. And so until we see a much more reliable quality control mechanism where we know that these are getting reviewed thoroughly and that we're not seeing these pretty common errors sneaking into the literature, you know, in some fields you can wave around a meta-analysis and say like, this is my trump card. I win the argument because I have a meta-analysis on my side. I don't think we're there yet. I, I think I think we need a lot more, a lot more education and a little bit of soul searching when it comes to the review process of meta analyses. And, and a really easy way to look at this is, uh, you know, Zordos Helms. You guys work in academic departments. How many people in your hallway, if you just handed them a data set and said, "Make me a meta," how many would feel really, really comfortable with that? Some, but not everybody. Certainly not everybody. And I think the question then becomes, well, who's, who's reviewing all these meta-analyses? Because there's a lot. And I know a lot of researchers, but I don't know that many that could construct a meta statistically. And so if those are the people reviewing the metas, if, if you can't walk through the mechanics of how that analysis works, it's very difficult to review it thoroughly. And so my, my big takeaway from, from uh, this year in mass, just from the studies I wrote, is we, we got to be really careful about metas. We, we have to review them as thoroughly, if not more thoroughly, than, than the individual studies that go into them. If you've been noticing a lot more reviewers asking uh, you to review papers, a lot more, you know, journals, uh, that's because every time a meta-analysis comes across my desk, I, I put your name down as and, and reject it, my own, my own review. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this is what you've created, uh, and, I, and I hope you're willing to to be the savior of us all for these meta analyses. Yeah. I mean, it's a sweet, it's a sweet gig. Like, um, that during that time I, I could be working on other things <laughs> that are fun or enjoyable or compensated or compensated, but it is a compelling argument to say, why don't I put that stuff off, cancel that date with my girlfriend and review this paper instead. So Helms, it's great to know that you're the person that's, uh, inundating my inbox with all those requests i, I appreciate yeah. that Tr trucks just just keep the note and you can um every time you review a meta don't forget you should put it in the service category so when you submit for tenure in mass the committee will review it <laughs> that's yeah i i will certainly remember to okay. do that um how many years do i need for tenure uh the the committee hasn't decided yet it's kind of open-ended typically it's three or four um, however, the committee has left it open-ended uh, based upon when your work has reached the level of perfection, international recognition in 107 countries, and 
every title is has been ranked in the top five percent of all mass titles. So you submit whenever you see fit, but uh, you can only submit one time, and uh, the committee will take it under consideration. It's really at our discretion. So uh, that's the vague criteria. I mean, we we also only have three spots, so y- <laughs> yep. you're you're probably going to have to hold on until one of us dies. Well, I mean, Eric. Uh, so yeah. given the general, but, but look at but look g- at Helms. given the general trajectory of Helms and his <laughs> his advanced age, uh, and also how many hurricanes are currently hitting Florida. <laughs> uh, if you can hold on for three years, y- you have a pretty that's good, a good shot. point. Now, one thing that's been helpful is I've been doing a lot of self citing in my own mass articles, so my mm. ass index is through the roof. Had we kept the ass you, acronym for the anybody for the show for listening, the publication. I would say you could thank me, but perhaps you you're on Helms' side on this. Going back to I don't know January 2017, when Helms came up with this uh, uh, research applications in strength sport, and I said no because people could call us our ass, and he said immediately. <laughs> He immediately said, I know that's the point. (laughs) So what I deemed as just something that could not happen, he looked at as a benefit. It's a a feature, not a bug, Mike. Uh, Our ass is is what we could have been today. Uh, I actually forgot that was really the one we had that conversation about. I remember Uh, because I was very adamantly (laughs) against this. And, and, And I was very much on the side of mass. And, uh, I would say to my surprise, but knowing you, maybe not to my surprise, you were pushing back the other way. And I'm, I'm glad that I held strong, but maybe some, some out there would have preferred that Helms would have won that argument. I would say probably the vast majority of people. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, guys, we probably only have time for one more here. And, uh, given that Helms has so much, uh, I, I, kind of as a consolation prize, since he wasn't able to name the publication and he's been salty about that for a few years, I, I think it would be fair if we let him take the last one here. Well, and I, I'm sure we'll get Mike back on the podcast at some point, but like, really, how much more time does Helms have left? That's, <laughs> that's yeah. this is like you, you give him the keynote spot just as a tip of the cap and say, listen, we appreciate the body of work. The last few years, you've been slipping a little bit with the quality, but we still pay that respect. You don't put me on the panel. You give me the keynote because you don't want me answering questions. You can treat this as as what you get for your Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th- the reason that I wanted to save this one for last is because uh, this one was more of a concept review. And it's about a topic that I think everyone, all of us uh, have an interest in. Um, and it's talking about progression frameworks for hypertrophy, how, how to advance uh, training over the course of a mesocycle when hypertrophy is the goal. I know that all of us have an interest in resistance training programming, so it's a really nice uh, kind of round table approach to finish things off here. And this was also a topic that generated a lot of conversation in the evidence-based fitness community. Greg, we kind of talked about this on the uh, on the podcast several episodes ago, but Helms, why don't you give us a little rundown about this concept review, a progression framework for hypertrophy? Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I appreciate this consolation prize. I, I appreciate this, this appointment as, as a keynote on a podcast. Um, I don't really see my career advancing beyond this point. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to apologies for that little intro, but I'm just kind of basking. So um, people who are you know in, in our community are probably aware of the numerous uh, podcast that both myself, Mike Isertel, Brian Miner, uh, Jared, Jared Feather, and some other authors on two recent SCJ articles. Um, you know, we've talked about it outside of peer review, uh, and there was also uh, their peer-reviewed article in, in the most recent SCJ and our LTE. Um, but I, you know, the the one I wrote for Mass that came out this year, it almost stands to 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 the side of that whole conversation um, because. I've noticed independent of whether you think uh, or, or, or what time scale you want to increase sets over for hypertrophy, I think it's really important important to understand uh, volume for hypertrophy. So that was my main motivation for writing this article. Um, you know, credit to Stronger by Science, uh, 
Um, and I'm forgetting the author, but Greg, could you remind me who, who's the author who wrote about the new way of counting volume that you always get misattributed as the author of this, but counting sets for volume? Nathan Jones. Yes, Nathan Jones wrote a fantastic article uh, that I would say was ahead of its time, but an accurate representation of the collective data we have on volume for hypertrophy specifically that said, hey, you know, we maybe we should be looking at, at hard sets of a reasonable repetition count. I'm not even sure if that reasonable rep repetition count was part of the equation yet, but back in either 2015 or 2016, um, I think 2015 actually, this article came out and basically, much like a systematic review, listed all of the time points where a number of sets had a more predictive relationship with which group would hypertrophy more than volume load. So the conversation about volume changed fundamentally in our community right around 2015 as a direct result of that article. Um, and it shifted the conversation from being about volume load uh, to being number of sets. And this really makes sense from kind of a Henneman size principle or effective reps, quote unquote, framework, uh, even though I know we've, we've poked some holes in the, uh, I would say, the rigidity of the effective reps model. Uh, but the idea that if you do a set, whether it's a set of 20 or a set of six, and you go to a reasonable proximity of failure, eventually you get to the point where you're recruiting the vast majority of fibers in a muscle and you produce a similar per set stimulus for hypertrophy. So boom, 2015, that happens. Conversation changes. And now all of a sudden, when you talk about volume, uh, there's a large, significant number of people who are taking that to mean set volume. And I think that's that's a good thing if we're looking at it from the perspective of uh, hypertrophy. Um, however, when that gets translated into actually enforcing progressive overload or, or seeing progressive overload occur, it changes the conversation in a way that is potentially problematic. And what I mean by that is that if you simply use a fixed number of sets and a fixed program, but you were just to allow progressive overload to take its course, and let's say a three by 10 model on any given lift, as you get stronger while you're training for hypertrophy, your volume load will increase because three by 10 times 100 kilos is gonna produce less volume load than three by 10 times 105 kilos. So you could have a program where you had a, a fixed RPE target and a fixed number of sets and you'd let your, your load expand and you would see that volume load would go up. So the previous conversation was kind of like, hey, you know, if you're getting stronger, uh, your volume load's going up. We know volume load is, is, is the relationship between hypertrophy and training that is most strong. Uh, now that's not perfectly true, but it resulted in this mindset of, hey, so long as I'm getting stronger, that's okay, that's good. Um, but then the conversation changed to, okay, I need to be increasing volume. That's what's related to hypertrophy. And I saw a lot more people who were increasing sets in a more proactive fashion uh, over the course of either, you know, mesocycles or, or some other time scale. So kind of independent from the idea of mesocycle progression, I think it's really important to understand that you can always increase sets. The only thing that is going to prevent you from increasing the number of sets you want to do simply not having enough time. So it's very easy to expand that variable to a point where it's actually counterproductive. Uh, while it's very difficult, if not impossible to do that, when you're looking at just reps or load, because you are limited by your actual ability to perform. So that sounds like just purely a cautionary tale. But what I presented in this article was that you can use those two things in relationship to one another. You can establish a given set volume you think is appropriate, you think is stimulative. And then when you can no longer meet your progressions over a time scale that's reasonable for your training age and the conditions you're in, hopefully not a diet, for example, um, that then you'd be able to see, okay, I can no longer progress and you can assess your level of recovery. And from that point, you can then make a decision to increase set volume. So one informs the other, and they have to be seen as distinct types of volume. Uh, seeing volume load go up is an indication progressive overload is occurring. When volume load is no longer going up, that's an indication you should perhaps do something. And if your goals are hypertrophy, uh, you know, lifting heavier for a set of eight is not directly stimulative of hypertrophy. It's indicative of an overload. So that's kind of where that, that, that algebra changes a little bit. And I think it's mostly a useful concept piece because hopefully it changes the conceptual way people look at programming for hypertrophy to see true volume increases in the number of sets as a pathway 
uh, to stimulating further growth when you see a plateau uh, in, in volume load, which is increasing via reps or load on the bar, depending on how you're progressing, whether that's increasing sets or sorry, reps to a point, then increasing load or keeping reps fixed and increasing load. A lot of the various progression metrics we had before, uh, you know, thinking of a, a set advancement as a volume increase. So that was the purpose of the paper. Um, I really do think it stands aside from the discussion of whether a mesocycle is a reasonable time course to increase number of sets or how aggressively that should be done that you might have heard between myself uh, and Dr. Isratel uh, and Brian Miner and Jared Feather. I think that's a really cool discussion, but I think the gold in this article, in my opinion, is just having that understanding of the difference between volume load and set volume and understanding how they can work together to inform you on when you should make an increase in set volume. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I really like about the way you talk about this concept is using your performance um, when it comes to, you know, looking at the load used and the reps successfully performed and uh, even the reps in reserve set to set and really using that as valuable information for, for kind of steering the ship as you go forward. I, I know the way you speak about it really resonates with me because that that's really how I do a lot of my programming with, with clients. Um, and sometimes I have to tell people like, don't go into the gym. You know, you, you've got your loads listed, you've got your sets and reps and, and you know what weight you're using. Don't go in there and give me a heroic effort and somehow overcome the odds and outperform your capability here. Like I'm just trying to learn from how we're doing here, you know? So, so seeing that as, valuable feedback to dictate the next move, I think is extremely valuable. Um, and, and I always tell my clients, like, I just want consistency, go in, give me what you got, tell me how many reps were left in the tank, and, and we'll adjust from there. Um, and you know, yeah, sometimes, you know, based on the numbers we're seeing, it's like, hey, we're really not able to bump these loads much week over week. Are we doing too much? Are we doing too little? Do we need a deload? And sometimes you increase that, sometimes you reduce them, sometimes you go to a different set rep scheme, you know, but but the feedback component is so important and that's what's really valuable about making those little incremental changes um, you know just by bumping those loads up week over week is that like the standard uh, approach that you take I, I think you mentioned in in your in the publication exchanges um, doing kind of like a a double progression method is that accurate yeah, that that's kind of uh, that. That was now to be clear, you know, Brian Miner, lead author on that one. So he had a more dominant role in writing it, mm -hmm. and so some of uh, one one contribution that I really appreciated was that we didn't just write the LTE to say, "Hey, there's problems with this paper." catch you later because this is the strength conditioning journal it's written you know mostly for practitioners it's not jscr and has a slightly different focus it's predominantly articles written about what you should do in practice we wanted to finish it off with hey here's a model that might might make a little more sense given our criticisms and brian really wrote that section and uh, he uses what's called an auto-regulated double progression model so real quickly for those who don't know double progression is simply the idea of not changing the load uh, until you reach a certain rep target on all your sets. So let's say, for example, three by eight to 12. Once you take your eight RM or your eight rep load at whatever RPE, and you get the three sets of 12 at that RM or RPE, then you're allowed, quote unquote, to increase load and you go again, right? Now, you can also uh, throw an RPE or a rep range into that uh, so that you kind of hang around a specific RPE. And once you can get a fixed number of reps, at an RPE, that's when you go up. So you, now you're not, because the criticism of double progression is that it basically leads everyone to eventually crushing themselves to get those three by 12s, right? Uh, you're, the first one might be worse form. I got my 12, the next one's a 10 RPE. The next one you may or may not have actually done the, the target exercise to get that set of 12, and then you get to go up and load, and then, then it doesn't go well at all. Now you've gone up and load, especially given the exercises. You know, if it's dumbbells, you got to make sometimes a 10% jump and load. And, and now you're barely even reaching that eight rep target. So to get around that and to make it a little more auto-regulated, throwing in the RPE component uh, can give that indication like, look, we're not after performance at all costs. We're trying to match the pace of adaptation. Uh, and that was Brian's, uh, you know, addition to that. I really like that. Um, as far as how I roll with it, I think philosophically, I'm 100% in line with what you said, Eric. I will trade theoretical optimality for more diagnostic clarity every time. Uh, that is something when I was purely an athlete, 
I made an, I made an error all the time with, you know, I would take the quote unquote shotgun approach. You know, I heard this is good. 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 I've read to way too much research. I'm following way too many people. I'm going to do all the things that should optimize progress. And then when it does or doesn't work, I have no idea why I, I took a new supplement. I followed a new program. I increased number of sets every week. I also advanced my RPE. And I also have a linear uh, progression of, of, of reps and loads. So my reps are going down, my RPE is going up, my sets are going up. And I think that's actually a very normal way for people to train. You know, they go from eight, seven, six, if they have a strength interest, their load is going up, their RPE is going up, and they progress sets. How do you know what actually worked or didn't work? And just to give a little bit of, uh, I guess, <laughs> anecdotal name credibility behind this, um, I, I'm not the only coach who's gone more and more towards the direction of diagnostic clarity uh, and also even at a very high level. So to drop uh, another Mike, uh, Mike Tushir, if you watch kind of the progression of his career, and he's, I, I would say, one of the more respected thinkers uh, in the kind of applied uh, you know, world of, of powerlifting. He, he works with many high-level IPF lifters who are already uh, world-class elite lifters in their right, and he's helping them get better. That's hard to do. Um, you know, making someone who already has a 500 Wilkes get to a 550 Wilkes, that's something you don't sneeze at, you know, and he has gone, I would say more extreme than I am on this, on this kind of uh, spectrum. Uh, he takes a microcycle, leaves it fixed and just allows load to go up while meeting, meeting, meeting a certain target RPE. And then he will look at which components when he does make a change and only makes one change at a time led to a reliable increase in, in, in strength in 1RM. And then he will see the time to peak for the individual athlete and use those to, to help his athletes get better. So I think philosophically, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when you get to the point where additional adaptations are very difficult to achieve. You know, if you're working with, let's say, high-level drug-free bodybuilders or high-level drug-free powerlifters, uh, that you really want to be able to know if what you did did something uh, beneficial or harmful. And that means you want to be very careful when you add complexity to a program. That complexity better be worth it, in my opinion. You know, one thing that I'd like to add here to a discussion that I've enjoyed listening to is that for everybody out there, when it comes to data and science on programming for lifting weights, you know, I used to say it's uh, science, but it's not an exact science. But I, I think it's even even more elementary than that. It's kind of a science. Like if you if we go through a supplement study, we are going to understand the proposed physiological mechanism of that supplement. Then we can debate if it increased reps performed to failure, if we think that's meaningful for hypertrophy or not. But we understand the mechanism of why that might work. When we consider all of these different programming options, and you know, Eric, you, you mentioned the the double progression model, and I, I wasn't familiar with the terminology, but I uh, gave those exact recommendations in some of the low progression uh, videos I did for mass, along with a lot of other things, and it made me think that, you know, what some of those videos did, and and some of an uh, article I wrote for for Greg's site a few years back, um, uh, is that we're just coming up with metrics that when we hit those targets, we can then make some sort of change. So all we know from science is that that's a good idea. So what Mike Teixeira is doing is probably even more scientific than trying to implement every single scientific principle under the sun. Because in no study have we actually shown all of those scientific principles uh, together to actually work. Beside from the fact as a coach or a programmer, you're handicapping yourself by trying to implement all of these things at one time, and then you implement none of them by trying to do all of them. And so what Mike T is doing from what you're suggesting, he's looking and saying, okay, what's causing this change? So he's trying to actually be more scientific than some of the scientists by saying, all right, we understand that you need to make a change, that you need to overload somehow. Something needs to be different, but I want to figure out what's doing this. And I understand that it happens. Different things are responsible for that on the individual level. So I'm not going to treat every person the same because if we go in this study and I, I thought of this earlier too. We were talking about something else, but um, it, it was on the refeed study. When you know, Trucks brought up the point: how how big did you want the effect to be? 
in a training study, do you know how hard it is to get significance when you have eight people in one group and eight people in another group and you change one periodization or progression variable or whatever it is? Oftentimes, if you see, I, 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 if you see a significant difference, I wouldn't be surprised if that difference is by chance at all, just because you have these individuals that are in the study uh, that have, you know, very different, di very different things could cause different changes for them. So I really like what you talked about what Mike T is doing. And all we're doing is, is looking for, okay, once we hit more reps, now we can add more weight. Maybe it's once we hit more reps, now we can add more sets. We did three sets of eight at a nine RP. Once we get that three sets of eight down to an average of a seven RP, now we can go ahead and add more weight to that. Or once we hit three sets of eight down at a seven RP, now we do three sets of nine. That's a similar concept as well. And if you're training for hypertrophy, for muscle growth purposes, for bodybuilding, I should say, the, the cool thing about that is it's a, it's a much more forgiving method of training than training for strength. Whereas if you're training for, you know, it's different. I don't want that to sound like it's easier because it's not. Um, that, that, that would be a very big misnomer to take from that. Um, but it's more forgiving in the sense that, hey, you missed a rep or you did another rep, no big deal. You needed to, you're in a different gym and you had to switch this exercise today, no big deal. But if you're getting ready for powerlifting you meet, you got to squat, you got to bench press. If you overshoot the nine, nine and a half RP and you fail on a set and you have a meet next week, that's not a good idea. But for bodybuilding, you can put all of these different metrics into play and find out what works for you. So to me, it always goes back. So if you understand this concept of once you hit this metric, now you can progress this thing. Maybe for you, it's session RPE. I notice once my session RPEs tend to go down, I'm feeling more refreshed, and then I add a set uh, to that to that next session, and then I feel good. But then people always take this to say, I have to add a set. I got to add the set on the squat. You can add the set on the leg extension. It doesn't have to be the main lift every time and progress some volume in other ways. So you have metrics, whether it's hitting a target number of reps and adding another set, hitting a target number of reps, adding uh, uh, more load for that, hitting a target number of reps and then adding more reps, you know, whatever it might be, you can make these changes. But if you understand those concepts, I would challenge everybody to, to think about all of these other different ways that we haven't even talked about metrics that you can measure that might be more specific to you to be able to make, uh, uh, to make these adjustments and progress going forward. So it's just to say that Eric, what, the roundabout way of saying what you brought up about Mike T one, it, it's so much credit to him for everything he's done for the community over the years. And then I view that as kind of the ultimate scientific approach rather than what we try to sometimes do as scientists, which I think is uh, uh, kind of the irony of, of the whole thing and, and credit to Mike. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to are you applying the scientific findings or applying the scientific method? And I feel like his approach is applying the scientific yeah. method, which is actually, uh, you know, for, for, for his needs, uh, you know, he's making his changes based on scientific findings, but that scientific method, that methodical approach to uh, manipulating that variables helps him really hone in on on exactly what is what is actually causing some of these changes. So, you know, th that diagnostic benefit of trying to minimize the number of moving parts at any given time is just extremely, extremely valuable. So I, I think that actually wraps up our discussion here. Greg and I very much appreciate the the other half of the Mass Research Review team for joining us. Uh, Mike Helms, thanks so much for uh, taking time with us today. True pleasure. Yeah, thanks to you guys. We really appreciate it. In addition to our special guests, we'd also like to thank all of the listeners for joining us for this special episode of the podcast. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we are currently running our biggest mass sale of the year, with a huge portion of the proceeds going to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. If you want to take advantage of the sale, be sure to subscribe before it ends on November 30th. Thank you for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate it, and we hope you enjoyed the show. We will be back with another episode in two weeks. Thank you for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter to get concise breakdowns of relevant research, as well as 28 free training programs for all skill levels and all schedules. We hate spam just as much as you do, so we'll only email you when we have something really interesting to share with you. You can sign up for the free newsletter at strongerbyscience.com newsletter, or just go to the Stronger by Science homepage and click the free programs button at the top. If you want to join in on the Stronger by Science podcast conversation, be sure to check out our Facebook group and our subreddit. 
The links for both are provided in the description of today's episode. Finally, please remember that we are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. So before you make any changes to your exercise or nutrition habits, be sure to check with a qualified healthcare professional. Once again, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast.